Thank you for joining me for our fifth midweek Lenten service. Pastor Scott Mosier will be here at Calvary tonight preaching on the theme again, God on Trial Misconceptions. I'm going to look for a few moments at his sermon text in our devotion time now. We're going to begin by using the beginning of the order of service for our Lenten service. We worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this holy season of Lent, we gather in the shadow of the cross of Christ. Let us turn our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We seek the truth of God, trusting in his unfailing mercy. His compassion and grace will never cease. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. O Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my cry for mercy, and in your faithfulness come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Praise be to God for his gift of forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Our Passion History reading for today is the fifth, re fourth reading in the Passion History section of the composite reading from the four Gospels. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who is misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. Now he has done nothing worthy of death, so I will have him flogged and release him. At the time of the festival, the governor had a custom to release on the, to the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a rebellion in the city and for murder. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For Pilate, in fact, knew that they had handed Jesus over to him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, she said, since I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They all shouted together with one voice, take him away, release Barabbas to us. Jesus said to them, then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? What should I do with Jesus? who is called Christ. They all said to him, crucify him. But the governor said, why, what has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, crucify him. Pilate addressed them again and be, because he wanted to release Jesus. 
But they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. He said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no grounds for sentencing him to death. So I will whip him and release him. But they kept pressuring him with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified. And their voices were overwhelming. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort, cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff and hit him repeatedly on his head. They also kept hitting him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the people's purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked him, Are you not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus. But the Jews shouted, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha, in Aramaic. It was about the sixth hour on the preparation day for the Passover. Jesus said to the Jews, here is your king. They shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing and that instead it was turning into a riot, he decided that what they demanded would be done. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. So then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. After they had mocked him, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus was carrying his own cross. As they were going out of the city, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in front of the in front in from the country. They placed the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people was following him, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen to the dry? In 
We'll continue now with our hymn, hymn number 357, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Jesus, Lover of My Soul, let me to thy bosom fly, while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest hill is high. Hide me, O oh my Savior, hide, till the storm of life is past. Safe into the haven guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, O oh, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on Thee is stayed, all my help from Thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of Thy wing. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in Thee I find. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick, and lead, he, lead the blind. Just and holy is Thy name, I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am, Thou art full of truth and grace. Plenteous grace with Thee is found, Grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, Make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. The word of God we want to consider this evening is from Luke chapter 23, verses 1 to 12. The whole group of them got up and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow misleading the nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? It is as you said, say, Jesus replied. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they kept insisting, he stirs up the people, teaching all throughout through Judea, beginning from Galilee all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see him because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle performed by him. He questioned him with many words, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and experts in the law stood there vehemently accusing him. Herod, along with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and ridiculed him. Dressing him in bright clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies of each other. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who art our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow followers of Jesus, 
When you get right down to it, no one who's mentioned in our reading really understood Jesus. As we continue to look at our series this Lenten season, God on Trial, today we look at misconceptions, misconceptions about Jesus. And let's look at misconceptions by those who put Jesus on, on trial, misconceptions today, and how in Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, those misconceptions are removed. Well, let's start here with the whole assembly that led Jesus away, putting him on trial. This was the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. That was the group that put Jesus on trial, God on trial. They heard Jesus confess that he was the Son of God, but they didn't believe it. They said that Jesus was worthy of death, but they didn't have the power, the authority to carry out that death sentence. So what they did is they brought him to the Roman governor, to Pontius Pilate, their official charge against Jesus, their accusations were misconceptions. They consisted of two lies and a half-truth. The first lie was that Jesus was misleading the nation. And when you get right down to it, Jesus was trying to lead the nation into truth. He was straightening out the teachings of the false teachers that those Jewish leaders were promoting. The second lie was that Jesus refused to, refused to pay taxes to Caesar when Jesus had in fact said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar. And the half-truth, that was that he claims to be the Messiah, a king. This was true, of course. Jesus did claim to be a king, the Messiah, the chosen one, and that's who he is. And he is a king. But when they presented this half-truth, what they meant is that he was posing as an earthly king, a threat to Rome, a threat to Caesar, which certainly Jesus was not. The Jewish religious leaders, they just didn't understand. They had these misconceptions because they didn't want to understand. Pontius Pilate didn't understand. He had misconceptions too, but he had a different reason. He had probably heard about Jesus, but you get the impression that he didn't know all that much about him. Early on Good Friday morning, this crowd of people outside its headquarters in Jerusalem, they brought, outside Pilate's headquarters in Jerusalem, they brought Jesus to him, accusing him of claiming to be a king. Pilate's response tells us what he was thinking. He asked them, are you, he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And well, we heard more about Jesus' trial before Pilate last week, but we can say that Pilate really didn't think of Jesus as a king, as a king in opposition to Caesar. He saw no threat to Caesar, the Roman Empire in Jesus. So his whole goal was to send everybody home, to let this be over, to not be a mess there in Israel. When they mentioned, when the crowd mentioned that Jesus was from Galilee, uh, Pilate thought that this was his way out, that Galilee was the jurisdiction of King Herod, so he could send him to Herod, who happened to be in town because of the Passover celebration. Herod may be the most interesting figure in this reading. He wanted to see Jesus for a long time, and I don't know if he knew that three decades before this, his father had killed all the baby boys in the Bethlehem area to try to get rid of Jesus. He don't know if he knew that this was the same, the same Jesus. Herod 
and had a complicated relationship with John the Baptist. Herod liked listening to John the Baptist, but sometimes he also wanted to kill him. And eventually he had John Bap beheaded, and that was because of the insistence of another, his mistress, his mistress's daughter's request, if you remember that story. Now there was another prophet who was like John, and that intrigued Pilate, intrigued Herod. But this Jesus, he could do miracles. You can imagine the excitement that there was for Herod when Jesus was brought in. Let's see what this prophet knows. Let's see if he can perform a miracle, a magic trick for us. But Jesus didn't do any miracles. He didn't answer any questions. He didn't entertain Herod. Herod only heard from the Jewish leaders who had their accusations to hurl against Jesus. And what a letdown as, as Herod's anticipation turned to disappointment and then to boredom. Well, he and his soldiers, they had some fun at Jesus' expense. They dressed him up as a mock king. They mocked him, they abused him and then they sent him back to Pilate. The people who put Jesus on trial today have a lot in common with the people in this account. Like the Jewish leaders, religious leaders today, people, when they think of Jesus, they often think of him as a threat to them and their way of life. They know him and they don't like him and what he stands for. And well, then like Pilate, some people have these misconceptions about Jesus. They're less motivated by hate and more by just apathy and not wanting to deal with it. They don't know much about Jesus, but they aren't much interested. And that apathy is something that is going crazy in our world and and. Even people who profess to be Christians are dealing more and more with that apathy today. And then there are those who are kind of like Herod. They've heard about Jesus, they're intrigued by him. Maybe they hear that he's a friend of sinners and maybe they think that Jesus is going to approve of their choices, their bad choices. Perhaps they think of him as the original rebel and inspiration for their political causes, or, or they've heard that he can help and turn lives around, so they picture him as this magician who will wave their troubles away with this magic wand. When they learn more and more about Jesus, then they kind of lose interest or even turn against him. But now what about us? Where do we fit in? in this account. Sadly, there is no one in this account that we can emulate, but can we consider a moment that we might have something in common with the antagonists in this story, perhaps even, even Herod or, or Pilate? Maybe there's apathy that we deal with in our religious lives. Maybe there are times when we are misconceiving who Jesus is. Maybe we think about him as if he was this divine vending machine, this divine mending mach vending machine that would dispense blessings to us and then get angry at him when we give him our money, when we give him our offerings and blessings don't automatically appear. We gladly accept the good things that he sends into our lives, but chafe under the troubles that he might allow into our lives as if there could be a Christ or, a, or Christians without a cross. Perhaps we think that we can enjoy forgiveness without forgiving others and without fighting against the sin that would be in our lives. The problem, the thing we share with everyone else in this story is an inward focus. The Jewish leaders, they were really thinking just about themselves, about their political and their tr 
cultural influence, about losing their position of authority. Pilate, he was just thinking about his job and how the Romans would look at him. And Herod, he seems to just be thinking about his own entertainment. And, well, sometimes we're like them. Our sin is like a warped lens that distorts our view of Jesus so that on our own and with our own intellect, we see what we want to see and we get these misconceptions about Jesus. I said that there's no one in our reading for us to emulate and of course that's not really true because Jesus is there. Jesus is here, but Jesus well, in some ways, what Jesus does is he kind of fades into the background in this account. For the most part, he keeps silent. He isn't willing to do tricks for Herod, and he refuses to answer the false accusations against him. When he does speak, he is respectful and truthful. He is steady, faithful, perfect. In fact, Pilate and Herod both confirmed that. Pilate and Herod both confirmed that. Pilate sent Jesus to Herod because he couldn't find anything wrong. And when Herod looked at Jesus, well, he also sent him back to Pilate for the same reason. These were men who loved inflicting pain and and injury to people, and as far as Jesus was concerned, they really just wanted to let him alone because they saw him as innocent. Luke notes that these two, Herod and Pilate, they became friends that day. They also, teaming unknowingly, teamed up to exonerate Jesus. They were saying, Jesus is innocent, and the innocence of Jesus is what you now wear, his righteousness, bright like the robe that they put on him. So let's not let Jesus fade into the background. Look at Jesus on trial here. If you're keeping count, this was now the second and third trials of that Friday morning. Jesus hasn't slept. At every stop, he receives abuse and mockery. He knows the path that he's going is going to lead to the cross, but that's exactly where he wants to go because he knows who he is. He's your substitute and my substitute, your sacrifice and my sacrifice for sins. He's our Savior. This is the Jesus that we want the world to see, the one who suffered and died for us, who paid for our sins. And now, see, he's better than a magician, like maybe Herod wanted to see, who can wave a wand in our troubles. He's the Messiah who washes away our sins, who pays for our sins. He's more than an inspiration for those who fight for freedom for the oppressed. He actually frees us from Satan's sin and death and hell. And he has such love for sinners that he cannot just simply approve of our sins and leave us trapped in them, but he forgives us and he went to the cross to take care of them for us as you and I present this Jesus to the world and try to work to get rid of the misconceptions that people have about Jesus, there's no question that many will continue in their spiritual blindness. And therefore, we can expect mockery and opposition. If others don't understand Jesus, they're not going to understand us either. But I do think we do have opportunities all over the place to witness to people, especially to those people who are maybe kind of like Herod, who are intrigued about Jesus for one reason or another. You know, in our country, it'd be hard to find people 
who haven't at least heard about Jesus and who maybe because of that have their questions. But what do they know about Jesus? Have they heard about his great power? That he's tender and compassionate? That he taught peace? That he brought peace? That he has a special part for the poor and the downtrodden? Well, that's all true. But there's more to Jesus than just that. And we're happy to say it. Jesus, what he'll do is he'll make us bold to stand before people and testify about him. Think about him. Jesus stood before a governor and a king. And three days earlier, he stood before his disciples and he told them that they should be expecting to be called before the authority. And the Bible tells us about how some of them did that. Peter and John, they were brought before this same Sanhedrin or the apostle Paul. He was brought before another Herod and other Roman governors. We probably won't be called before kings and governors, but we can expect expect to stand before people who have their misconceptions about Jesus. And we, with the word of God and with the Holy Spirit's help and power, we can work to remove their misconceptions about the real picture. I said that no one in this narrative really understood Jesus and, well, no one that's mentioned here really did, but in this narrative, remember that Luke wrote these verses to a Theophilus, that's the first reader of this letter, of this book. He wrote this book to Theophilus and he was a believer who, who knew about Jesus, who knew about the Savior. And he's also writing to you and me, and be so very thankful that we also know about Jesus, the Savior. Well, by God's grace, we know who Jesus is. We know it, and we know it only by the Holy Spirit's power, only because the Holy Spirit has worked on our hearts through the Word. Our eyes have been opened to see that this man on trial was God on trial, our Savior on trial, and he was on trial so that we don't have to face the judgment. In him, we have life now and forever in heaven. That's God's gift to us and our gift that we can share with the world so that they don't have to live in those misconceptions about Jesus, so that they too can know Jesus is the Savior and the way to eternal life. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, in our congregation, we continue to have people dealing with different trials and troubles. And, and so we think of Tony Alfaro, we think of Diane Kennedy, and we think of Paula Burris with increasing problems with the infection and circulation in her legs. And Paula asked us to think about her friend Faye with whom she's trying to share the gospel. Lord God, please keep on reaching out to these folks. Give them your help and your strength, but especially give them your grace and your mercy and love. Help them, help them help all of us to know who Jesus it really is. The one who lived and died for us, who paid for all of our sins, who won for us heaven. And so we gather up all of the prayers we have tonight as we join in praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray, Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all afflictions, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth. We pray through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Thank you again for joining me for this midweek Lenten worship devotion. We have one more Wednesday service coming, and then it's Holy Week with Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and of course Easter Sunday. Again, thank you for joining me. The Lord bless and keep you always. Amen. <laughs>